Glory be to God. I thank God for this opportunity we have gotten to continue studying this word. And I thank uh, the organizing team. Uh, and I thank all of those watching from wherever you're watching from, those who have joined. May God bless you as we study his word. Uh, today, we want to talk about uh, to put back the sword in the sheath. It's quite interesting, so we want to dive in it, but let me first offer prayer. We may start. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful time. As we dive into your word, we pray that you may guide us, cleanse our hearts, and may, may our cups be filled to the brim. Help us to understand your word, for I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, what is to put the sword back into the sheath? Let's see. Mark chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus said, But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, as he said unto you. And the scripture there seems to point out someone specifically who is called Peter. So the, all the disciples were talked about, but here they mentioned Peter specifically that go and tell all his disciples and Peter. So Peter is as if he's categorized alone. And if you go to, the, to any Sabbath school class and you ask, how many disciples of Jesus do you know? Or name them. The, stu the student will just tell you, Peter. I know about Peter. So, but here they are saying, tell his disciples and Peter. And according to that, it is as if Peter is not a disciple, if he's mentioned differently. So, and if you look at the Jesus choosing the 12 disciples, Peter was among them. Now, as we go on, you will notice that when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet, he, said, he, he, he came to all of them, and only one, again, had an argument with Jesus. And he said, you will not wash my feet. So Peter seems to have a character that, that goes against Jesus Christ, what he does. Because Jesus said that I'm going to wash your feet. But Peter said, no, you won't wash mine. It is me to wash you. So, and they, they had a very big argument. We know that. But it was something that Peter could not understand. So he has a character of not first understanding what Christ is going to say, but is interested in only what he thinks. So the character of Peter, okay, of course, you are Simon, is that mm, what I know, regardless of what the word says, what I know should be go first. I don't care what, what Jesus you say, but what I care about is what I think and I know. And Jesus went and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples saying unto them, whom do men say that I am? And, uh, he, and, and they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elias and others, one of the prophets. And he said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? So when, when they gave a group answer, Christ came now individually and asked, whom do, do ye say? that I am. Now tell me individually, what do you say that I am? And the, and the one who spoke again was Peter, answereth and saith unto him, thou art the Christ. So when everyone kept quiet, Peter was the only one who could speak. So he looks to be the spokesman of the entire dis discipling group. So as the disciples are gathered, Jesus asks only Peter answers. Uh, 
and he says, uh, I say unto you that no man can come unto me except if it were given unto him of my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? That is John chapter 6, verse 65 to 67. So Jesus tells them that no one can come to me except if my father draw with him. So many of them did, went and only a few remained. And ask them, will you also go away? And when he asked that question, it is again Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. So Peter has this confession of thou art the Christ, the son of God. And here he says, thou hast the words of eternal life. So he seems to have this confession of knowing who God is, or who, who Jesus is. So he's very knowledgeable. But listen to carefully to what he has that is different. He says, and we believe and are sure. So he, they asked, will you also go away? An individual question. But when he answers, he says, we believe. Now, who is we? Did he consult all of them to know who we is? Because he would have said, and I believe, and I am sure, but said, we believe and we are sure. And that includes who? That includes Judas Iscariot. So by saying we believe, even Judas believes. So he has this dangerous character of speaking for the entire group as if his word goes to the entire group. So like what he says is what the entire group says. So it says that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. So the, the problem with Peter there is we believe. So what, what is personal becomes the, the, the thinking of the entire group, even if he has not consulted each of them to see whether they believe what he believes. And Jesus saith unto them, all ye shall be offended, that is Mark 14, 27. Now we are going to see this one. All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For this it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. So Jesus is giving uh, a prophecy of what is written. So Jesus always quotes, even to the disciples, he says, it is written. And I will, he says, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. Okay, what is the response? And Peter said unto him, so among all, when everyone kept quiet, Peter came up again to react. Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. So the scripture says he will be offended. And Jesus is quoting the scripture. But Peter says, no, no matter what the scripture says, I don't care, but for me, I will not. So when you go to the NIV, it says, Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. So he's saying, you are saying, we shall sleep for us, we shall not. We cannot sleep. How can you say the entire discipleship? So if we take Peter to be the 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 head of the discipleship, you are, you are looking at this man, the spokesman. So if this is the disciples are the church, it seems there's a character of someone in the church that even if prophecy says something, that there will be a division in the church, there will be this, the, uh, I will smite the shepherd, all, all people will, will fall away. They say, no, we shall not. We shall forge anyway. I know for us, we know Jesus, whatever you're saying, you don't know it. For, for me, I know better that others can fall, but not I. So I will not fall. That is a character of Peter. He speaks for many. And now here, he is even going against prophecy. So do you have a, such a mindset today where people who, who look to be the spokesman of 
of the church have the mindset of, of, of saying that what professor says, we don't care. We don't care what professor says, but for us, what we know and what we do is what counts. And Jesus saith unto him, so now he goes personally. Verily, I say unto thee, remember thee is singular, ye is plural, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. I always wonder mathematically why this could not be crowing twice and you deny twice. But it is before the cock crows twice, you will deny thrice. It means that he would deny, the, 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 by the time the cock crows twice, he would have gone even in excess three times. So that shows how dangerous Peter, Peter's pride is, that by the time the cock comes to give even only two, for him he would have gone three times. So look at uh, this leader, this spokesman, who calls himself we, the entire discipleship, just by his words, he speaks for all of them. And he says that uh, Jesus tells him, you, the leader, the one who has, who has to speak, I want to tell you something, that thou shalt deny me thrice. That's, in, that's interesting. So he will deny God. But he spake the more vehemently, if I should die with thee, I will not deny thee. In any wise, now this, in, in the NIV it says, but Peter insisted emphatically, trying to emphasize his point, that you know Jesus, uh, these things, I understand them better than you. Whatever I have said, I, I had the other one, even this one, I have had it, but let me tell you something, for me, I know, these things better even if the scripture says it even if you you even warn me but what i'm telling you is that i peter the one who whom you got from the from the sea i will not deny it in any wise even if the scripture writes it so this mindset of some people in in in, in within the flock of christ trying to go against what prophecy said is very dangerous. But interestingly, is this last is this part? It says that I would not deny thee in any wise. The, this part says, likewise, also said they all. So now the, the, the major these others move with Peter, and they also consent that we will not also deny thee but they don't know that peter is using pride he's speaking against his prophets but they are all following look at this mindset we have today in the church is it possible that it can come a type that the type of peter can be applied to the church as jesus comes and is walking with us before he's crucified he tells them that towards my crucifixion and we have another crucifixion of Jesus coming in the, in, the, in, the, in the person of his saints, those who keep the commandments of God. And he tells them that time is going to, to come when Christ will be smitten. In other words, the, the, the Christianity and the word of God and truth will be trodden to the ground and everyone will scatter to his own place. And the leader said, no, 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 we shall force anyway to make sure that we are together. We shall, we shall go back and make sure that we go back to the churches and be there, uh, if whatever happens. And again, they say, Jesus tells them, you, very, the very one, you, you people, you will deny me. And, and they say, we cannot, no matter what the scripture says. And the rest of the church, the people, the church, all follow blindly. They just say, likewise, also said they all. So there is a blind uh, follower, a follower group of people that follow Peter just by what he says. They don't even scrutinize to see whether it is written. But if he says it, 
they just fall. This is very dangerous. Uh, uh, Bible commentary, volume five, uh, page 1123, paragraph five says, how true was the savior's friendship for Peter? How compassionate his warning, but the warning was resented in self-sufficiency. Peter declared confidently that he would never do what Christ had warned him against. So he went against the warning, not knowing what it could produce. Right now, Christ is warning us in the spiritual prophecy, in, the, in, in his word about what is going to happen, but it seems to be a mindset of Peter within the ranks of God's people, within the discipleship itself, the call that the, 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 Ad, the Adventists, God's people, where we have this mindset where people can resent the word of God and prophets and say, though the, the, that one is there, but we shall not allow it. The Bible says there will be two groups in the church, the tares and the wheat, the, the goats and the sheep, the, 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 the what? The, the wheat and the tares, I've talked about them. All these will be in the church, but for them, they say, no, 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 no. That one cannot be. We shall cleanse the church and make sure that by the time Christ comes, we only have this one group. Christ says, no, there will be that. But they resent that, that they would never do what Christ has warned them against. And he took and he taketh with him Peter and James and John and began to be so amazed. So he gets these three, Peter, James, and John, the very ones that were on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he takes them, and Peter is there as well. And, to, to, and, and began to be so amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. So the instruction is, tarry ye here and watch. So think about this instruction. Now he goes, when verse 35 and 36, and he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that, that Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will but what thou wilt. So, verse 37, and he cometh and findeth them sleeping. Okay. The instructions were, careful, were clear. Stay here, tarry ye here, and watch. So, which one did they pass? They tarried, but never watched. So the problem with the church towards the end when Christ is about to be arrested is, in fact, the biggest. Because these were the, the leaders. James became the, 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 the elder of the church and Peter. And these were, the, these were the leaders. But the ones he chose and took, they were asleep. But they are the ones who said, we, we, we can never, we, cannot, we shall always stand. And they said, all of us. So he tells them, tarry here and watch. They tarried, but they never watched. So the problem of the leadership, maybe in future or now, is that they tarry, they stay, but they don't watch. Is that true? Is that a fact today? Among us, God's people, among the leaders of Israel, that they tarry, but they don't watch. So they stay in the church, they are very okay, they come and sit in church, they are around, but when it comes to watching to know what is happening, they are asleep. So type must meet anti-type. And saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldest not thou watch one hour? Now, look here. He says, and he said unto Peter, this is reported speech. Remember, Mark wasn't a disciple. So he's reporting. And he said unto Peter, Simon. So Jesus, 
who called him, he said that Simon, you will be called now Peter, Petros, okay, or Caiaphas, a, 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 a little stone. Now does not call him Peter, but calls him Simon. In other words, it seems as if Jesus is calling him the old name. He is no longer worthy to be called Peter, but he, is, he calls him Simon. So is it possible that in the antitype that time will come when those ones who are given the title Peter, because they are sleeping, they are not worthy to be called Peter, but Simon, the old ones, because of their sleep in church. So it, as we are living in this time, all of those who keep be sleeping in the church, they keep sleeping spiritually, the spiritual sleep, Christ sees them as Simon, the old ones, not Peter. So he says, okay, watch ye and pray. So the first one was tarry here, stay here, and watch. They passed staying or tarrying, but they never watched. So Christ is a very good teacher, Rabbi. He says, okay, watch. Now he, he ticks the other one and says, now do correction on the watching. So there's a watching there, do corrections. They are doing correction of watching and praying. So he always gives them two. They are always two. The law and the prophets, the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus, the, 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 the wine and the bread. There's always two, two things. So he tells them, watch ye and pray. Lest ye enter into temptation. So the, the reason why they should watch and pray is because temptation is coming and they may enter into it. But if they watch and, and pray, they will not. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. That is the character of the three men, the leaders of the discipleship. They are really weak. The flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. So, and again, he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again. Okay. I thought maybe they had woken up by now. But they continued sleeping further. Look at what is happening to God's people while Christ is about to be arrested. While Christ is about to be smitten. When he's taken to be crucified. They are sleeping. So the lead. The leaders which who are picked to be spiritual, to go and be closer to Christ, they are asleep. Is this the condition we are going to be in that we, the leaders, may be asleep? For their eyes were heavy, neither wished they what to answer him. <laughs> they could not even answer a single word. Wow. So are we about to enter that time where we are already in there? that right now we see a very big silence in the world when it comes to the leadership of the church nothing you don't see, you don't hear anything when it comes they talk about corona they talk about the vaccine they talk about this they talk about this they keep quiet totally there is a, a very big silence as it seems the sleep is already uh, uh, on the way uh, uh, and then cometh the third time, and said unto them, sleep on. So when he came the third time, just told them, sleep on, and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of the sinners. Can you imagine Christ telling them that sleep on? Okay, continue. Because it, it is no longer going to benefit you. Take your rest. Uh, should we wait for this time as leaders? that Christ says now continue sleeping. Now, if the leaders are sleeping, what happens to the, to the masses? The masses are dead. So he says, okay, sleep on, take your rest. It is enough. The hour come, the, the hour is come. 
So time is coming because they are sleeping. Remember uh, the parable of, of the man who, who saw the good seed and while men slept, the enemy saw the bad seed. Again, they slept, the watchmen slept. But when they woke up, they found that, hey, the, 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 there is already the bad, the, the bad seed and they wanted to do something. So now they're trying to show off that they're working and they are very, they are very responsible at this point, but they were not responsible when it was being planted. He says to them, rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. Okay. So they get under arrest and they arrest Christ. Peter is still sleeping and the other three. And by the time Peter knows that his master is arrested by the time he wakes up his master was already arrested and he remembered that he had promised to him that he would not he would not deny him neither will he leave him so now he does anything physical to prove his point though he's weak do we see a mindset of what is coming in the future when the leaders will be sleeping and we try to do anything to prove that we have been awake. So he moves so fast and draws the sword. John 18 is the, is the only verse, 18, 10, in the gospel that tells us who had the sword. He says, and Peter having a sword drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Peter draws the sword and, and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. You know, there's a lot of typology in that, but that will be another time, another sermon when we talk about Malchus. But think about it. They cut off the right ear. Why the right one? Think about it. And what was this high priest's servant doing at this point when the war is about the high priest and Christ? But Peter comes and is, Peter is trying to fight for Christ. His, Christ is being arrested. So the man comes with a sword to, to kill someone. Do you have a, such a mindset that, they, that people have swords today to try to defend Christ for uh, among those who may come to be wounding him. You know, you are, uh, the, uh, you are trying to wound the church and they come up with a sword to, to, to smite anyone and cut off their ears that they may not hear at, all, hear at all. Do you have such a mindset? There is Peter drawing a sword. Now, that in, let's look at this sword uh, according to Luke 22:38, it's as if there were oh, there were already two swords in the discipleship because Luke 22:38. we shall look at this a little um, in, in, in a little while but there are two swords doctrine that the church talks about we are uh, I've given that in in some lectures but we can again review it. There is Catholic culture that says two swords doctrine, a medieval doctrine of the relationship of the church and state. And says, as explained by Pope Boniface the Eighth, who ran during that time, we are taught by the words of the gospel that in this church and under her control, there are two swords. So a church has two swords, the spiritual and the temporal. Both of these, i.e. the spirit and the temporal swords, are under the control of the church. So the church, there's a church that claims to have two swords, and that church is Catholicism. This, the first is wielded by the church, the second is wielded on behalf of the church. The first is wielded by the hands of the priest, and the second by the hands of kings and soldiers but at the wish and by the permission of the priests. So in other words, what soldiers and kings and presidents, whatever they wield, the sword, it is by the 
by, by, by the wish and by the permission of the priests. Does that tell us in the future that the army will be under the control of the church and the church will be dictating whom, who should be slain? Because it was the high priests who came and, and commanded the Roman army and the Romans to come and arrest Christ. So here we see that in the future, as we see here, the, 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 the priests or the leaders will have control over, the, of, over both swords. So in the church and in the state. So the state listens to the church. Sword must be subordinate to sword. And it is only fitting that the temporal authority, which is this, the, the, the presidents and the kings and the soldiers, should be sub subject to the spiritual. That is Unam Sanctum, Sanctum, this is 873. So let's go to the French Revolution and see something interesting here. During the French Revolution, uh, there was a, um, uh, uh, something interesting where they brought uh, the woman and they showed that this is liberty leading and there was a woman holding a flag and she was showing her breasts of course the, that's the the god of liberty or, or as we shall see the future so the goddess of liberty lifted up the banner and there they brought the declaration of human rights there it is the first one in 18 in 1789 there came the declaration of human rights and it is interesting it has a lot of uh, masonic symbols there is the the the, the all-seeing eye and there are the the two angels one pointing to to the all-seeing eye and the other one pointing down and again we have there another one in red and blue and this one was putting on purple and all oh, these are interesting colors of, of 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 rome and she has a chain as if they're saying we are going to chain them in human rights it seems uh, this looks to be the picture they're trying to tell us that human rights will be a chain that will enslave people so uh, we are we are trying to to try we are trying to to um, try here to find out what these mean to interpret the symbols and it is interesting they made the the uh, this um human rights declaration was put on two tablets of stone written on two what was written on two tablets of stone isn't it the ten commandments and now the original one is clearly here put. Written exactly as the Ten Commandments. Isn't this something that tells you that we are going to replace the, word, the law of God with the, ten, with the human rights? So today, what do you hear most? Is it the commandments of God, the commandments of God, or the, the human rights, human rights? So human rights seems to be uh, taking away or has already taken away the commandments of God. You won't hear people quoting the law, even within the ranks of Adventism. It is not about the law of God. What does the law, the, the law say? This one should be this. No, 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 no. It's, it's the rights of, of people. They have a lot of symbols. Of course, there is the serpent biting its tail, which is a Masonic symbol of the, 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 the serpent, which gives itself life. And then we have here the fash, which we call uh, the, the band of, of rods, which they call the fasciae, from which we get the word fascism, which is the, the greatest system of rulership of, 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 uh, of the Roman Catholic system. So there is fasciae, fascism, which means all authority into one man. So giving all the third and two and one is fascism. So this tells you that all nations must give all their authority 
to one man, and this one man must make new rules which will replace the commandments of God. So who is the only man of sin who does not want the commandments? Of course, there must be one in Rome. And there, when we go, let's go to the Statue of Liberty. That's, that's the other woman we saw, Liberty, uh, in the French Revolution. It was revived uh, in America. Statue of Liberty, Liberty enlightening the world. And it says there is a, is a sculpture on Liberty Islands of, in New York Harbor. And says the, here that the statue is a figure of Libertas, a robbed Roman liberty goddess. So this is a symbol of a goddess. And it stands in a Protestant nation. And she holds a torch above her head with her right hand. Okay, so here we have a female deity, a goddess and she is called Libertas. So the liberty that is given to the nations is from a woman. Do we have a system today, a, a church state system, which has a female leading and, and she is advocating for liberty? Do, do we have even another one, Mother Earth, that tells people that they should be uh, given the liberty and given freedom and people have, don't have to to say some things just because it would annoy the other. And there she is, Libertas. And they tell us it's a statue of liberty. No, this has nothing to do with that. This is religion. Libertas, the goddess, Libertas, the one who gives liberty to people. And it's interesting that this is the cornerstone that was laid on this Libertas. So whose, whose gift is this? Let's get it closer that you may read it. And it is, there you will see the, all the symbols of Freemasonry. 1984, and they will show you as, uh, and this, at this site on August 5, 1884, the cornerstone of the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty enlightening the world was laid with the ceremony of William a Brody, Grand Master of Masons in the state of New York, Grand Lodge members. So it's a Masonic work. And says here that this plaque is dedicated by the Masons of New York in the commemoration of the 100th anniversary of that historical event. So the Masons seem to know the origin of this. Since they, were, they are Masons, they know what all these things mean. So. They were called Masons, why? Because they were free to do things as long as they, 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 they obeyed the ruler. So today what shows that someone is subordinate to another? Because now we see here Libertas, who, has, who is a Roman. And this that is sent to United States and you can, you can, blow any other thing in America, blow the parliament, blow anything, but you cannot blow the Statue of Liberty. Why? Because there is a goddess there and she's the one that supports this country. Let's see. This is the Department of the Army of the United States of America. And the logo is very interesting of the army. It has a serpent there with its tail, and it's interesting that it says, this will defend. Not this will defend, but this we will defend. So in other words, who will defend this? So it's from the serpent's mouth, according to, the, to, the, to this logo of the army of the United States, that they will defend. What? What will they defend? Liberty? What? Who is the, the owner? There is the cup of, of the Phrygian, the Phrygian cup, which was a symbol of liberty. So liberty, they will defend. And 
United States itself uses a logo of the ego. And, and we rem remember in that Rome had the symbol of the ego. The ego was a symbol of Rome. So there it is showing you that these ones are, are wielding the sword on behalf of the king. And everywhere you go, you find the sun, which is a symbol of, of the subordination of, uh, of those, of the God of the sun. You'll always find the sun somewhere to show, even in the courts of arms of countries, to show that they are subordinate to some power. Even in this logo, you will find there is the sun and it is in the center. It is in the center to show you that some people are also subordinate to this power. So you cannot say the one who holds the, 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 the two swords is the same, but one sword is wielded on behalf. Now let us look at these two swords and see. Uh, Jesus tells his disciples and they said unto him, behold, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. So let us see what this meant. It says here that um, uh, Luke 22, he said to them, I send you without pass and script and shoes, lacked anything, and they said nothing. Then said he unto them, but now he that hath a pass, let him take it. So he told them that when I sent you, I sent you without a pass, a script, or shoes, but you lacked nothing. But now, since we are now going to something else, but now, he that hath a pass, let him take it. And likewise, his script. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Now remember, garment is a symbol of righteousness. So is, is Christ saying that we should sell our, right, our righteousness in order to buy the sword? Or he's talking to some other group of people that is not sending the other ones. So when he sent them, they lacked nothing, but said unto them, but now he, the other people, the other side, it is now they should, that they should, if they don't have a sword, let them buy one by selling their garment. So in other words, the people who will join the enemy will have to sell their righteousness in order to buy a sword by which they will use to kill God's people. For I say unto you that this that is written must be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. So he's telling them that we are going for war between good and evil. So me, when I sent you, you as the disciples, you lack nothing and you don't need a sword. But there are those who are on the other side, if they have no sword, let them sell their garment and buy one because for them, they need a sword. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. They never understood what Christ was trying to tell them. He said, okay, it is enough. Just as he said there, sleep on, it is enough. Was that a good one? Sleep on, it is enough. And again, he says, he says unto them, it is enough. Which means that that's not what he intended. But because they don't understand, it is enough. We have seen this. This is the Catholic Church and the Renaissance and Protestantism by Alfred Baudrillard with a preparatory letter from His Eminence Cardinal Perrod. He says about the Catholic Church, page 183, uh, she calls the laws of the state to her aid. If necessary, she, she encourages a crusade or a religious war 
and all her whole of blood practically culminates into urging the secular power to shed it. So the church has the has the power to call the the civil the, the state to come and carry out whatever she wants. So in other words, uh, it does not matter who is who who is going because when she command when she commands come they just come why because they are the ones that wield the temporal sword she wields the spiritual one especially did she act thus in the 16th century with regard to protestants so now how does she wield this sword Fratelli Tutti, short summary of Pope Francis, is a social encyclical. Let's go to it and see. This is the new encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, and let's see the summary. I got it directly from vaticannews.va. Let's see what this one says. Chapter 5 of Fratelli Tutti, the encyclical of the Pope concerning fraternity, which is the whole human family better politics so now listen to what politics should do the state the theme of chapter five a better kind of politics which represents one of the most valuable forms of charity because it is placed at the service of the common good so politics is a service to the common good and recognizes the importance of people understanding and understood as an open category available for discussion and dialogue. This is the populism. This is the populism indicated by Francis, which counters the populism, which ignores the legitimacy of, of the notion of people by, by attracting consensus consensuses in order to exploit them for its own purposes, services, and fomenting selfishness in order to increase its own popularity. But listen to this, but a better politics is also one that protects work, comma, an essential dimension of the social life. So there must be people that are protecting workers the best strategy against poverty, the pontiff explains, does not simply aim to contain or render uh, indigents inoffensive, but to promote them in the perspective of solidarity and subsidiarity. The task of politics, moreover, is to find a solution to all the attacks, to all that attacks fundamental human rights. So politics must find a solution to all the attacks, to, to all that attacks fundamental human rights, such as social exclusion, the marketing of organs and everything, weapons and drugs. Excuse me, now who, has, who, who gives the drugs? Where do they grow them from? sexual exploitation, slavery, all these things. The Pope makes an emphatic appeal to, to definitively eliminate human trafficking, a source of shame of humanity. But these things are done openly. And he says the best politics is, is to find a solution to all that attacks fundamental human rights which we have seen already written back there, which have a religious aspect. So anyone who will attack those human rights, politics will deal with you. So there you see him who calls leaders to work for the common good. And says here, uh, the, the, the uh, Alex, something here. Building that world, he insisted, requires a car encounter and dialogue, processes that allow people to speak from their experience and culture. 
So you won't speak from the word of God, but from experience and from culture. Are we seeing this developing within the, 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 the Peter mindset that you have to only, because these are the, the, the Peters who claim to be Peter, and they're saying that you have to, you have to use experience and culture to speak from their experience and from culture and to listen to one another learn from one another and find ways to work together for the common good okay so the peter mindset is towards the common good so if you see this peter mindset telling people that we don't care about the word of god we care about experience and culture today in many countries hyperbole, extremism, and polarization have become political tools. The Pope wrote, employing a strategy of, rid of ridicule, suspicion, and relentless criticism in a variety of ways, one, one denies the right of others to exist or to have an opinion. Okay. Let's see here. The social aggression often found on social media has spilled of, over into mainstream political discourse. He said, he said, things that unite a few years ago, things that until a few years ago could not be said by anyone without risking the loss of universal respect can now be said with impunity and in the crudest of terms even by some political figures. So they are trying to warn even for us who are speaking on social media, who have social aggression, that it's dangerous. Okay. So for the church, he added, the Pope is challenging us to overcome the individualism in our culture and to serve our neighbors in love. So the Peter mindset takes our individualism and that's why peter never wanted to speak of, of for himself but for the entire group individualism is gone no we speak for the entire group what we say should be taken at all levels this is the sword that is removed to take our individualism that when you have a choice you want to take as an individual it's a crime and the sword must be removed to cut off your right ear. But what did Christ say? And Jesus said unto Peter, put up thy sword into the ship. So he told him, put it back, Peter, put it back. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? So in other words, Peter, However much you are trying to show that you are working for Christ, removing the sword and cutting everyone's ear who tries to, whom you think is, is against Christ, Christ has told you, put down the sword, put back the sword into its sheath. What you're doing, it is enough. It is enough. Stop it. If you already had the sword, if you touch Jesus, you are in trouble. There are those who seem to defend the Peter mindset that seems to defend the truth with a sword and cuts off all the ears of the, of the people they find on the way who, who, who seem to be against. But Christ's objective lesson, chapter 4, says openly that, that Christ cannot entrust that work with, with us. He knows us too well. He has not given us that character of judging character and motive we cannot so whom do you suspect or suppose to be against christ that you may remove the sword to cut off his ear who are you christ says peter put back the sword in the sheath and peter put it back so will you be like Peter. He slept. And now he's trying to prove to Jesus that, is, that he's really on his side, but he was not there. He slept all of those hours. Right now, 
men sleep and they find some things in the church and the only thing they do is to try to fight and cut off the ears of those who, are, who, who, who seem to be attacking Jesus. And they don't want them to ever have anything. They will be chased out of the, the synagogue. They will be banned from pulpits. They will do anything. This is the sword. Please stop wielding the sword. Stop it. Christ tells you, put back the sword into the sheath. May God bless his people and may God bless his church as we put back the sword into the sheath. My fellow leaders, it is not our duty to cut off the ears of people, the right ears, just because we feel they are dangerous and they are wounding Christ or they are wounding the church and we have to do something, remove the sword, yet we have been sleeping. Like the other men who are supposed to watch over the, over the, the, the wheat, the man planted the tares and they started growing together. And again, Christ says to them, leave them to grow together. Put back the sword in the sheath. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful time we have had. May you please bless us to understand these words that when prophecy says something, we should heed it. Look at what happened to Peter. But this is a warning because the Bible tells us that all these things were written for admonition on whom the ends of the world are come. Dear Lord, we pray that you may guide your people not to take the sword in their hands and, and, and let them surrender the sword to you. We put, they let them put it back because it's not required at this time. The cup that you must drink, you have to drink it. And that's why you said, come behind me, Satan, to Peter, because this mindset is against the truth. Help us to understand this in Jesus' name. Amen.